All right, so I'm going to introduce Quincy Markowitz. They are the co-founder of Farm Bird Sanctuary, a bird-only sanctuary with a focus on disabled birds located in southern Wisconsin. In addition to providing sanctuary for 70 plus birds, Quincy engages in community action, including, including suing a small town that engages in a chicken toss event every year, yuck. Uh, and Quincy has been working with chickens for over 10 years. We're very excited to have them here. Please uh, welcome Quincy. Hey. Hi, well, thank you so much for having me. Am I, yes, everyone's hearing me fine. Thank you so much. And I apologize for just getting here a little bit ago. Um, I actually had to drive about 30 minutes away into town to get reception. So that's one of the perks of sanctuary living, if anyone is, is ticking off pros and cons. Um, so I do have a bit of, so, oh, and this is Pluto, the most important part. This is Pluto. He's one of my very many uh, roosters that live in the home with us. He was rescued um, from a cockfighting bust. That's amazing. Yes, you were. So I'm gonna go in and I apologize. I'm just new to Zoom. So I do have a presentation. You are screen sharing. No. How do I move? Sorry about this, thank you. You present. All right, so there we go. Is that working all right? Do you wanna do a thumbs up, Rebecca? You're the only one I can see. Awesome, thank you. All right, so my presentation is called Living with Chickens and Making Your House Your Home. In my presentation, we are going to just discuss, um, I know we've already touched on a lot of the bigger farms and things like that. Um, but I want to touch on why it is that we don't think chickens are good house animals, um, like the lies that have been told to us and why they are wonderful house animals. Um, this slide features Petra, one of my house hens, and my cat Smudge. So let's see. Oh. There we go. All right. So there's a lot of propagation leading um, to a lot of myths about chickens. Uh, so one of the huge myths that we've already gone over is that farm life is the best life for chickens. So that's really propagated by the industry, all farmers, small, huge farmers, that farmers know what best, that farmers inherently just have a knowledge for chickens because they have thousands of them. Um, but that of course is not true. I put money in parentheses because Whenever you don't know what's going on, just think about the money and why, um, you know, there's an industry that profits off of eating chickens and their bodies. So um, a lot of these lies are really kept going by the industry and by people who, for better or worse, and for worse, want to um, justify their own speciesism and consumption. So um, it's not the best for chickens. Chickens generally on farms are not considered worthy of veterinarian care. That's because chickens we've priced at about a dollar or two. So in general, if a chicken gets sick, the most affordable option for farmers is to kill them. Um, and they don't do that humanely because that wouldn't be affordable. Um, so that, that's one reason that farmers don't know a lot about chickens. Um, there's fear of antibiotic resistance and drugs in their bodies and their eggs. So we've all heard of the you know, antibiotic free meats and stuff like that, which of course means that people with infections aren't getting uh, the meds they need. And of course that health uh, contradicts production. So the more eggs a chicken is laying, the more profitable they are and the less healthy they are. Um, there's also widely circulated um, beliefs about Cornish crosses that actually unfortunately a lot of um, vegan advocacy um, organizations contribute to such as that um, they'll die, you know, they'll, their legs will crush underneath them and they'll die painful deaths. Um, and the only humane thing is to euthanize them, which of course means the only humane option for a Cornish cross chicken is for them to die, which is exactly what the industry um, and small town farmers want you to think. So Cornish crosses are mm. um, literally double breasted. Um, they've been bred to have double the breast on their muscles. So they do get very heavy and over muscle because of that. 
And then of course, the more eggs someone is laying, the more stressed they are, which um, opens them up to illnesses coming in or reproductive illnesses. Every time they lay an egg, they're at risk of that, of course. So those are kind of the reasons I think people are nervous um, to get chickens, uh, but there are a lot of benefits to having house chickens. So uh, a lot of benefits to the chickens. So there we have climate control. So uh, um, the, a lot of backyard keepers really try to say that there's cold hardy birds living in Wisconsin. That's unfortunately a line that we hear constantly. Chickens were domesticated from jungle birds and no matter how many feathers you put on them, that absolutely doesn't change the fact that they are a jungle bird. They are not cold hardy. No one, no one lives in Wisconsin in the middle of winter. That's why we don't have a lot of parasites and a lot of um, those issues because no one can live here, including chickens. And I'm not bitter. And then so we can control climate in inside um, protection, 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 protection. Free ranging sucks. Uh, chickens are going to die from hawks. They're going to die from raccoons. Um, it, when we keep them in our homes, or I have like a little town set up. These are my um, disabled house chickens. So we have like Marie and Cat who have no feet in the picture. They were in the previous slide as well. Um, Flapjack, one of our disabled Cornish cross roosters, um, Yam and Petra. And so they don't need a lot of space um, because they don't move much. They really don't need a ton of space. So that's, they can just go out um, you know, in their runs or protected runs during the day and then we bring them home at, in the home at night. Um, so they can do very well in small spaces. And again, we wanna remember that free ranging is not, is not safe. Um, so having them in the home offers first and foremost safety, which should be their most uh, met need. Uh, vet care, so when we have smaller um, orgs or individuals um, keeping animals, they're likely to notice a lot more um, going on with their chickens. Uh, vets are absolutely necessary. We always wanna just make sure we recommend going to an exotic vet who knows more about birds, uh, like parrots and things like that versus a farm vet for the reasons that we already discussed. Farm vets don't know anything about chickens. Uh, individualized care, so of course, um, being in the home greatly benefits them because they're able to be seen very often and um, you know have more options. So there are some chickens that are gonna do the best in homes in my experience. Um, disabled chickens, again, often um, because they take more time or have more requirements. This is my disabled chicken flapjack uh, here getting a chiropractic adjustment uh, by a vet at the pet store I work at. So, um, you know, we can do things like that and really like pay more attention, offer softer surfaces. I do want to make a note that we say disabled um, versus special needs. So you may see, hear me saying disabled and not um, something that people are used to. And I just want to make a note that that is um, the preferred nomenclature by disabled humans, because um, disability is not bad. It is just a fact, it is not bad. Um, chickens deserve to live as individuals and people first and foremost, um, and we work with their disabilities accordingly. Um, Cornish cross chickens can really benefit from like restricted feed and softer surfaces. Um, those are, your like flapjack in this picture. So um, they really need restricted feed. Um, anyone with a chronic or recurring illness that will benefit from climate control, et cetera. Roosters, not for any particular reason, except for we need people to adopt fucking roosters. So if you can have a rooster, that's the best house animal you can have. They're amazing. I mean, they are amazing. We have a bunch. If you put up with the crowing, um, it's great. We have 30 roosters that crow in our home and we sleep just fine. So you, you can do it too. All right, so um, just a few reasons and I wanna make sure I'm not going, oh no, I'm blabbing fast, I'm not going long. All right, so I apologize. I've never talked into a void. Um, so I, um, there are reasons that chickens are more in need of homes. This is Stitch and Stan in um, one of our indoor runs in our upstairs. So. Um, Pretty much all of our birds are house birds, if you want to get real, because we set up these um, runs in our house. Um, so anyways, the reasons that chickens are needing um, more rescue, more placement is, of course, just animal rights being more on the forefront with things like social medias and vigils, where chickens are even taken from vigils a lot of time or escape. 
Um, so just more prominent and more rescue opportunities because of that. Um, sanctuaries and rescuers are needing placement. So, you know, people are telling us more now about dump birds. We've gotten two dump roosters this week. Um, within 12 hours of each other, we heard about them. One in a state park, one at a gas station. Um, so people, you know, reached out to us so they know that we're there. They now know that sanctuaries exist. And um, our sanctuary goes out and tries to catch every dump domestic bird at risk that we possibly can, every rooster, every chicken. It's never hen, so it's pretty much always roosters when they start crowing. Um, so of course, the uptick in backyard chicken keeping means we have a lot of disabled birds and roosters that um, are being discarded or looking for homes. And um, a plus is that shelters are now taking in a lot of these animals. So shelters like humane societies where we typically just see dogs and cats and other small animals being rescued. Um, some, like, hamsters and stuff like that. They're now taking in quote unquote barnyard animals or they're having barnyards set up um, and taking in like owner surrenders and things like that. So there are, there's an increase in chickens needing rescue out there. I'm just gonna show you Pluto real quick because it's ridiculous. Look at him, look how cute, he's just napping. <laughs> Who doesn't want that? If that doesn't sell you, I think I should just leave it on Pluto for like the next 10 minutes. And if that doesn't sell you to get a chicken in your house, then I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do for you. Anyways, so um, that is why we have more needing homes. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of end with discussing um, where we wanna adopt chickens from. This is very important to me. Um, so I put sanctuaries and chicken rescues up there first and foremost. Um, this is important to me because sanctuaries are not only taking in animals, they're, we're doing the advocacy work. Um, you know, we're making the social media posts, we're doing things like, I mean, everyone here, um, except for Hope who does amazing, I mean, puts together this webinar and everything, but you know, this is full of um, sanctuary operators. So we're not only doing animal care and learning the best care and promoting the best care that we can, we're doing webinars, we're doing um, vegan fests, we're doing all sorts of advocacy. So in my opinion, you should help us <laughs> because we are challenging the industry so we can get, so writing, when people write us and they wanna adopt birds from us, especially roosters, especially ducks, it's amazing. So that really is like a good way to give back if you have room and love, um, you know, to give back to sanctuaries who in a lot of ways are representing non-humans so i really encourage people to check in with their local rescues for that reasons um shelters are also wonderful for that reason and then um i do have a few ellipses because i like to address like so chickens are being given away on craigslist um facebook well it's still rescue and certainly um and you know an option to take any animal and provide them a home a lot of times this just um propagate you know it just keeps a lot of what we're discussing today going. Um, it gives uh, backyard keepers an out for their roosters when oops roosters are really a problem that the backyard chicken keeping industry and the humane meat industry should be addressing and talking about. Um, so we don't wanna enable people to like feel better about exploiting animals. So that's why I always encourage people to really reach out um, and try to find chickens that rescues have first before looking into other options. Um, so I think that is that is my my spiel and thank you all for listening to me and there's Pluto one more time. Hi Pluto. Hey. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, I guess we can go ahead and move into Rebecca once, Quincy. Are you able to stop sharing on your screen? You are shared, yes. Perfect. There we go. <laughs> okay. Hi there, and so I do share screen now. <laughs> yeah, let me, Rebecca, let me, let me introduce you real quick. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, so yeah, so while Rebecca is getting uh, ready for um, her presentation, so, uh, let me introduce Rebecca. Rebecca Moore was a performer and musician for many decades in New York City. Uh, she's the founder of the Institute for Animal Happiness, a nonprofit chicken rescue in the Hudson Valley of uh, New York State. 
After working over 10 years at, a large, at large farm animal sanctuaries, Rebecca found herself repeatedly bringing home chickens who required more special individualized care. Empowered by the micro sanctuary movement, Rebecca turned a small rented backyard into a nonstop busy advocacy hub, fiercely dedicated to a mission of care, activism, and change. The Institute continues to grow and brings together a mix of devotions that fit all into one unique organizational framework, animal rights, intersectional social justice, justice solidarity, and a dedication to art as a revolutionary force. Rebecca, please take it away. That sounds so highfalutin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really Introductions glad. are always the worst part. I just wrote that as a random bio and I never intended it for this kind of a thing, but thank you. Um, I will now share a screen. I'm new at this too, everyone. So, <clears throat> so let's see here, choose desktop. And then everybody can hopefully see my slide there. <laughs> um, so here we go. Oh, I hope I don't make a mistake. Here we go. <laughs> Technically scary. Uh, I have 15 minutes about with this. Um, and I just want to thank everyone, Quincy, for so I've learned so much from you and admire you and hope everyone here, Justin, you've all been like really incredible inspiration. So um, when I was asked to prepare for something for today and the subject being chickens uh, on the couch being deconstructed, uh, who is a companion animal, I really, um, I'm used to more rattling out facts about chickens and um, sort of educational stuff about facts about them and what, what uh, industry experiences they have. Uh, via um, animal agriculture, but my only way to kind of um, think about, it made me think, how did I start living with chickens? <laughs> and I thought I'd lay out sort of the progression in, in the hopes that anyone out there who wants to um, perhaps do this could see some commonality and, and step up. So I'm going to start my little timer here. And um, how we began, as most things, it often starts with one bird <laughs> and it was 2008. And here came this guy, Nelly. So Nelly was this amazing rooster. He was already six years old and his rescuers had rescued him as a baby chick from a county fair. And they saw that he had two really deformed feet and was sort of being left to struggle. Um, but they could no longer care for him. They drove him 11 hours from Michigan to the sanctuary, sanctuary where I worked at a big farm animal rescue in the Hudson Valley. And um, the, it was clear he needed really, really special care. Um, and I'll show you a close up. So he, it's, these were his feet. So they were incredibly deformed from birth defects and he could only stand on soft surfaces, Quincy mentioned. Um, and he'd been brought with a little pillow and he, it was put in the medical building and he stood on it like a little island in a stall. And, and it was just clear he needed more socialization. Um, and a lot of times the bigger rescues are taking on these really challenging large scale rescues. Around the time he came in, a hundred birds were due to come in. And so I just thought, let me figure this out. He was crying uh, in the stall by himself and my office was next door. So I thought, let me try to set him up. I had work to do and it was a very stressful place. So I was like, I'll just bring him with me on my lap and he was squiggly. And then I had my first light bulb moment, cat beds. And there were some cat beds around and I put the cat bed on, the, on my desk and he relaxed into it. And we started having this daily relationship with him sitting on my desk. And um, so it wasn't like I intended, I didn't like have some animal rights activist thought where I was like, I'm bringing chickens home. Or I really, to be honest, had worked in that vegan sanctuary for about a year already. And even I hadn't been able to that hadn't had the luxury of an individual connection with the birds because there were so many and there were only two people a day taking care of them. But um, sometimes it is through care and a care experience that we get to know someone better. Um, and so I basically um, 
I fell in love. I'm sorry, I made these cute little signs. <laughs> they said to make it cute and light. So <laughs> love it for a side, I, I, uh, I brought them home. <laughs> so for anyone out there, I saw some people were asking like, how do I do this? How do I have a, how do I bring a chicken into my home? Believe me, I didn't know. I grew up in New York City. Um, so my first attempts, I was in a one bedroom cottage were not that inspired. <laughs> I just made a soft area for him. And, um, you know, as cushioned as possible, I was at work for long hours. And then he had an out, he was fine on like grass and soft surfaces. So, you know, he had like an indoor life and he had an outdoor life, but more often than not, he was just hanging out where I was. <laughs> I don't want to suggest that he was just kept in a cage all the time. He really, I just started to realize um, that we were companions for each other. We were friends, you know, and through this process of care, I was just getting to know uh, him and chicken so much better. So, you know, basically, you know, that relationship went on and <laughs> I just wanna show, you know, him hanging out. So he's disabled, he, he can stand. Um, but again, he needed soft surfaces, so I would move him from areas to areas or be cuddling with him or have him outside in the grass. Um, later on, Tina came and lo and behold, she liked cat beds too. I should preface that I barely had a working computer at that point. This is now by like 2009, 10. In there, I, I didn't have a smartphone and I didn't know about Facebook. I wasn't on Facebook. I didn't have Facebook groups. So I was really just making it up and trying to figure it out. Um, so this pen would be the day pen. Um, by now, Larry had shown up. <laughs> and um, again, they were in the pen mostly to accommodate Nellie during the day when I wasn't home because he had to, he really had to be on a soft surface. Um, so I put try different things, hay on cushions, et cetera, et cetera. So you find yourself learning about each individual and sort of, um, you know, just like a human person rising to their, their needs and likes. Um, so then, you know, now it, it's uh, cut years later. So starting in 2008, this has been a long journey. So I think this is probably about 2015 or some 16. Um, you know, we have this room. So this is where they sleep or spend really cold weather days. They also had run to the rest of the house. And it's a really pretty, like a happy space. We started to call it the chicken hotel. <laughs> and, um, and I made it this happy place to work. And it was also a revelation, a revelation to me that, um, cause there's so much, you've heard of compassion fatigue with, with care, uh, for uh, non-humans that have been through a lot of stress, a lot of strain um, and traumas. And, um, but then also the, the act of caregiving, I think it really can wear on you. So I do my best, you know, when you're seeing a lot of suffering, I do my best to make the space really positive and full of light. So this is, again, we uh, just a small, you know, this is the biggest room in the house. We, we have it uh, set up for the feeds you can see over there and um, supplies. And there's some, there's another pen out of the photo and then towels. So this is an example of like sort of um, a sleep and rainy day setup. And, um, and then there's the rest of the house. This is another view. So, you know, again, on the subject at hand and showing chickens and how they are in our lives. Um, I started to document just little moments like Nellie deciding he didn't want to stay in the chicken room <laughs> and coming out of the house, out, out through the, um, the glass missing in the door, which I didn't, I didn't know he knew that was there. And so they started to definitely always tell me I don't really want to be in one area I want to explore. And um, Larry lived a long time. He just recently passed at about almost 10 years old. Um, this is just light moments in winter. We have two little bantam roosters hauling oats that were dumped in the area. And my friends, Greg, Goodbrod and Barton, they're watching, they rescued them. 
And um, I just leave towels and sheets or any laundry on the ground. And I turn around and I, they're having a party. And I was just, you know, loving seeing them, you know, to be honest, be just completely cool living inside a human home. They get outdoor, obviously they have outdoor yards as well, but this was winter. <laughs> So um, another, a lot of times in winter, I'll be honest, um, you know, winters in the Northeast are very long, very harsh. And um, so we, our one concession was like a big TV to like watch movies at night. And then I found that um, the chickens, especially Blanche, she sits right up front and I would put on educational programming, nature shows, and you can see she's just, she always is sitting there. She'll come from the other room and sit. Um, I started to become like a concerned parent. Like I don't want my <laughs> friends watching too much TV, but um, totally um, learning about them as individuals, their likes and dislikes and seeing them as housemates. You know, they're just, sometimes I just really forget we're different species. I'm just feel like they're friends I live with, to be honest. Um, so, you know, then I, this subject of the presentation made me think, okay, well, what, um, what else comes from chickens living in a human home setting? High quality care that can make a really life-saving difference. And if you're sort of a caregiver spirit, you know, and I, there are some people who do rescue really well, advocacy, everybody has their passion or their heart's work. And I think for me, I just really love the love caring and seeing someone be comfortable or well. So I started to take, you know, get calls about a lot of birds that were disabled or injured. Um, this is Honey, who had frostbite at a local farm and she, her foot uh, was lost. The farm called me, they just didn't see um, veterinary care as being worthwhile. So, um, you know, I picked her up and um, Quincy gave me advice and it was a three month process for her losing her foot. And I, I honestly feel because in that three months you're living with someone, it's not a nine to five job or nine to seven, you're just, you're really living with someone um, and you're able to see to their needs in this really um, profound and um, ever evolving way. So we tried so many shoes on her stump after she was healed and went through the three month process of losing her foot. Um, we finally found this little sneaker that protected her, um, her stump enough that she can even go on rocks because it was getting a little abraded. She can be fine without the shoe, but um, it was like I, countless hours and countless days and nights of devising things and trying things. Um, and then I'll go to, this is Squiggy. And Squiggy, there's a little music I couldn't get out of here. I hope it's not annoying. Miss Squiggy and Lenny were two chicks born uh, disabled at a farm in Westchester. Um, and so the traditional wheelchairs weren't quite working. Her legs couldn't even touch the ground. So she would be so inert in this chicken wheelchair. So we made this track and I found that she really did incredibly well in it and could, she, her legs were splaying out front, which you can kind of see there. And this is the progression of her starting to move those feet and get more and more active. And um, so it took me a lot of time to devise this and get it right and get the, the sub flooring right. But you're living, when you live with rescued chickens, you're living and breathing and thinking of their care all the time. And so at the end, she and Lenny can actually now stand and um, move around themselves. And so it's a huge difference in quality of life. And um, it takes a concentrated amount of time and effort to just make these you know, as for a micro sanctuary without a lot of resources to come up with these solutions. We're experimenting right now with a zip line and we use just a traditional um, uh, sling early on. It's very crude, I know. <laughs> um, 
but this was one form we were working with just, she didn't like being held a lot. Um, and she would spend so much time trying to wriggle out of our hands. She wasn't really exercising her legs properly. So um, the cool thing about this was uh, it gave her more exercise and we're now constructing a harness for Percy. This was like a week ago, um, Percy came in recently. Um, and uh, he was a rooster found in um, at Belmont Raceway by the rescue group Lion. And, um, the, you know, I think we're developing a real love of trying to uh, create solutions for sweet uh, people like Percy. <laughs> um, these are the relaxy taxis. These are little things. When I worked at big sanctuaries, we often had to carry in and out a lot of um, chickens from their indoor areas to their outdoor areas so you know or use dog carriers and things that really just didn't quite ever work or seem to stress them out and the birds here really love now honey runs to her carrier she sees it come out she's like we're going outside and she runs to it so it's um very gratifying to just come up with solutions again um this is my house but i just for people thinking about you know uh, stepping up and bringing any birds, uh, chickens into your home, you can find solutions like this was an old walker in our shed and it became the perfect foot soak, um, you know, sling for little buckles. And he's a rescue, he was a rescued caporo. So we share, you know, like every rescue does share these, you know, successes where they figure things out. Um, I certainly don't want to solely focus on chickens as being needy victims or um you know dependent souls that we're the heroes of but i do love sharing the care and um and, you know because i think a lot of people still ask me i didn't know a chicken needed veterinary care or needs some medical support so that's a big you know thing i try to do with our work so going on i'm checking my time here <laughs> my phone timer is a little slow um why aren't chickens more often seen as housemates and companions i had to reflect on that and think okay well there's poop people think they're about the poop but it also could be there's been a long effort by profiteers campaigning to distance humans from getting to know chickens because then you're getting to know the beings they want to exploit, the people they want to exploit. So I wanted to, you know, I was thinking just for this panel, like, well, what about the poo? I'd never thought about it in this context. And I saw someone in the chat asked about that. This is a wild robin. And while they are, you know, chickens are not descended from wild robins, but I was looking at birds and their habits in the wild. Um, um, baby birds, when they excrete, they, they poop in what's called a poop sack and the mother bird can just clean it out of the nest. So animals having these reputations as being dirty, um, it's really one of these human constructs. Um, uh, chickens being descended from tropical jungle fowl, obviously they could poop over, you know, vast ranges and it was never an issue. Now, human waste on the other hand, <laughs> Uh, the, the history of human waste management, this is one of the oldest sewage systems, it is the one in the world, it's Pompeii, and these are their aqueducts and those black dots are all the toilets in Pompeii at that time, and here's a modern sewage system. So humans have invested thousands of years and like untold trillions of dollars and resources towards, you know, managing our own waste, and actually we've done a pretty terrible job and we see it all in the ocean and you know we're polluting ourselves and so we have this species this notion that we can you know criticize other beings as being dirty or unsanitary so I reject that and I'm happy to have chickens in my home <laughs> and it's not my home it's their home it's our home um, to be honest, then my thinking sort of, this is, whole thing is a rambling musing, but I was thinking about, well, what is correct housing to, that people think uh, for farmed animals, for non-human animals? And, you know, we have the quaint barn, you know, the threadbare sort of structure, um, barrack-like, you know, stalls rusted waters. These are all accoutrements of the farming world. And 
have wonderful, you know, people just wax poetic about seeing that barn or that, you know, coop. And to me, I feel like I had to ask, is it really quaint? And I was asking this even at sanctuaries, to be honest. I was like, is it even adequate? Or is all of this hearkening to something truly oppressive and just sort of, uh, you know, it really made me think like, I wanna get away from all of this, the iconography of farms and everything. So why rescue someone from an oppressive system and structure, you know, just to place them back into another place that resembles those same accommodations and that same system and, stru and structure. And these are the kinds of things I think about when now having brought um, chickens into the house where we live together and I see all of our commonalities and also all of our differences in how incredible and totally badass they are um, and intelligent and wise. Um, so with the Institute, I'm definitely, uh, we're trying to get away from everything farm <laughs> and we're okay. We're okay with that. Not the outdoors and not being out in nature, but just getting away from that. Individuality and individual care can be diminished in a crowded, competitive, and stressful setting. So the beauty of doing this in your home is, you know, you, you if you step up, you might have, you know, just one or two, but you're making a huge difference and a huge impact in, in their lives. Everyone's personal expressiveness, whoops, sorry, <laughs> amplifies and grows when they're seen, listened, heard, understood, appreciated, included, and loved. So by making your home into a micro sanctuary and sharing that space, you know, you are doing that for someone. And I have to say that um, every, everyone here, it's not their job to teach me every bird, every chicken. It's not their role. They don't have to do anything for me, but, but, but accidentally, I have learned more from them than pretty much anyone. So um, I encourage everyone to think about, you know, the speciesism of who's a companion and who's a family member, to be honest, who's a friend and who, who we can make space for. We only have a half acre here. We don't own it. We're renters and we actually have to move in about a year, but like you can do this. Um, there's great resources like Micro Sanctuary Resource Center, um, Triangle Chicken Advocates, Farm Bird Sanctuary. Everybody's really there to share info on vegans with chickens on Facebook. There's so much and there's there's still a need for innovation, revolution, deconstruction, dismantling, and creating equity for all involved in sanctuary spaces, big and small, and for humans and non-humans. And so um, I believe that, you know, helping chickens is one way we can really uh, actively take part in a lot of change. So that's, thank you. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Rebecca. That was incredible. Uh, I have to say, I really love your PowerPoint. Oh, uh, and the movement, and you did a great job. <laughs> well, everybody brings their heart and their life experience to this. And to be honest, I, I gave up art to do this, but I find I'm an insomniac, and at night, if I can put a little creativity into a PowerPoint, it makes me connect with that again. <laughs> I, I love colors and <laughs> thank you. Sure. Well, we do have some questions and I think more are gonna come in. And one was why did Buckles need a foot soak? Oh, <laughs> he, um, thank you. And, and so many people had talked a lot of facts, a lot of ethics, and I knew I was going last. I figured everybody would be like, eh, to hear about, but uh, you know, um, the, a lot of, um, Chickens can be prone to um, pressure sores or foot infections. It's a lot, it has to do with how they've been bred to be too heavy, but you give them little foot soaks um, and you know, you can definitely, you know, heal that. <laughs> but it's a common thing. It's one of the things when, uh, that you have to check for if you wanna be a really good companion to your friends and make sure they're as healthy as can be. You do what's called Chick, you know, we call them chicken checks. <laughs> and once a month, you just sort of pick everyone up and check their beak, their feet. I love doing it because it's, I think they, I think they're a little, you know, 
they like, you know, just being care cared about, I think being seen, you know, being held, being recognized. <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to invite Quincy back. Quincy, where'd you go? Are you there? <laughs> Yay! Hey, hey, here I am. <laughs> All right. Um, Justin, do you see any questions you wanted? Yeah, yeah, there's actually a, a really interesting one. Um, so uh, the question is, do those who live with chickens and or have a micro sanctuary think it's possible to have a full-time out of home job and take care of our chicken friends as well. Um, uh, yeah, I know Quincy, you can probably have a good perspective on this. <laughs> Me too, actually. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you both do. <laughs> yeah, so uh, my partner and I both work full time. So yeah, you can work full time and um, do a sanctuary. It's, uh, you know, we have close to 70 birds and with working full time, it's pretty much the entirety of our life, which is great, which we love. Um, mostly, obviously there's like sac, I mean, there's sacrifices. Um, we can't go on vacations really, um, things like that. So yeah, it's, it's possible. And to be honest, probable that you're going to have to keep your job. Um, there isn't a ton of money flowing in for, uh, sanctuaries like we wouldn't we are lucky enough to get a lot of, like enough donations to defer some of our costs but like we're absolutely nowhere near getting where we would ever be able to pay pay ourselves so yeah if I may say I've had a you know I have um, I've had full-time jobs just until maybe about a year and a half ago but then I've created full-time work now. I work for myself, <laughs> but, um, and my partner, I help, I work, do some work for his full-time job. You know, they have small freelance jobs. And then we did start the local vegan festival to be twofold, you know, to help bring education to this area. And it does help bring in funds for the chickens, but I have to take other work all the time. <laughs> um, but it, it is the first time in the last year and a half and I'm 53, <laughs> I finally got, after doing this for so many years, I'm not doing another full-time job elsewhere anymore, but I'm still, and I don't know, Quincy, how you do, you're <laughs> phenomenal. I mean, you're like amazing, because I have 14 birds, and it's about, <laughs> I, I don't have, right? they are in our care. Sorry, mm -hmm. I'm sometimes not so great with the the language, but um, I'm trying to be better. But, uh, you know, it's about five or six hours a day for, you know, I would, mm -hmm. you know, but every, everybody can do uh, one or two, you know, and um, that is doable with a full-time job. Absolutely. And even a few more, but you get better and better at it and you find ways to keep the, the quality of life you want. That is critical. All right, awesome. Um, so there was a question, it, it kind of went through the chat and now it's come back again in the questions about chickens and litter boxes and kind of, and the, the poop in general. Um, and you cover that a bit, Rebecca, <laughs> in mm -hmm. the but I, but I don't know if you wanna go into a little more detail about diapers and things like that. There were questions about diapers and, uh, and poop cleanup, and if they can be litter box trained, so maybe a little more about that. Uh, Quincy, do you want to go first, or do you have anything? Sure. Oh. I, yeah. Well, for I, I guess I would say the main thing is for litter boxes. Um, don't put a chicken in a litter box. <laughs> they will. Uh, we we use a litter made of corn. Woo! It is delicious. So we can't. <laughs> we don't have our chickens anywhere near litter boxes. So no, that is not an option. Um, to be quite, we do some diapers. There are some amazing diaper companies, but to be quite, okay, this is what Poodle's got going on now. Check this technology <laughs> out. There's his butt, there's the paper towel. So I don't care that much. I, I find wiping up a poop to be pretty easy. Chickens tend to have like pretty solid poops until it's cecum time. And cecum time is like 5 p.m., like sundown. It's, it's on when you don't want anyone pooping on your furniture like during the night or like right at evening is usually um and cecum is like fermented poop so they do have some disgusting poops but most of them are like pretty easy bird poops and I don't mind um I really don't mind cleaning them but that's I have 70 birds living in my house so <laughs> I would say that 
there's a ton of cleaning. Um, but um, again, not if you have one or two. I mean, Quincy has a really large family, and, and so I'm sure you're working your butt off. But I'd like it's. I would say you creatively problem solve. So you saw the pictures that I showed. There are there are large pans for if I do have to go out and be at work, and it's or it's a bad day. Um, but when they're out watching TV or roaming around the whole house, I buy these um, very cheap, um, they're bedspreads that are like for pet people with pets. I hate that word, but you know, you can buy them on Amazon, throw them down the floor. I just, I just discovered splat mats, which are for messy toddlers, <laughs> human toddlers. They work great with chickens. And um, the bedding that was in those nighttime pens, they can poop away and I just scoop it out and throw it away. It, we have a compost, but you can also you know, just pick out the dirty stuff per day. And um, for those out there, I did just discover a new bedding. Oh my gosh, it's recycled cardboard cubes. It's like there, and it is, there's, it's low dust. It's almost no dust. It's the first one that says it's no dust that actually is. So um, it's changed my life here. Um, so it's, you know, easy to have, those were um, kitty swimming pools. And, and that's just for while you're at work, if it's big enough, you know, and there's enrichment or um, you'll find um, that they love cozy spaces too, not forever. You know, you don't want to be locked in a small place, but they, when, they know their home here. They know this is home and they know they are loved and they're given so much care. So if I have to go to a job for two hours, they're in the pen and um it can be done so you can go to work and keep it clean all right uh there is a question about roosters crowing and and possibly disturbing neighbors and so that is something that would need to be addressed if you are in a more uh, urban or suburban area and there are people around what 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 is your advice around that well you, first thing, you do have to know you're in a place zoned for roosters. That's very important. Uh, lots of places are. <laughs> um, and you can also, and house roosters are great um, because of this, because they are indoors. So if they crow, they're really not bothering your neighbors that much. Just keep them in at key hours, keep them indoors. Um, but, um, you know, crowing is something, I, I love the sound. I feel joy waking up to it. I, it's, I think it's just depending on the individual. Yeah, some of ours crow. I always do say that the smaller the rooster, the louder the crow. So whenever people <laughs> get like a bantam rooster and they're like, oh, I got a house rooster. I'm like, ha. Huh. <laughs> so that's one thing. Pluto's actually got like a very like low crow that you can't hear much. Um, the, the, the main thing to consider with roosters crowing is even if you're zoned where you can have roosters, you can still be subjected to noise complaints. So like that's something that I always want people to know um, because that you can still get noise complaints if you, so definitely check in with your neighbors. You know, I, I lived in the city with roosters for a couple of years. All my neighbors around me knew when we talked about it and it was still a stress that I wouldn't really recommend people putting on themselves. You know, if you have a really, like when we had a basement that was really like soundproof and stuff, like you can make it work, but you also want to make sure the main thing is, is like, if crowing is a deal breaker, then crowing's a deal breaker done. Same with like, if cats having claws is a deal breaker, you don't be clawing, you don't get a cat. So that's kind of my view on roosters is we don't want to, we don't want to be putting collars on them. Um, you know, we don't want to make them feel guilty for crowing. It's a very natural behavior. Um, so I just, that's one thing that I really, if you don't want crowing all day long, because they don't, they crow most in the morning. That's, like, that's where they get you. But they crow all day. They crow all day. So if crowing's an issue, uh, roosters may not be for you. Yeah. I have to say, I have one or two hens that are louder than any yes. Yes. here. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Blanche. Yeah, the, the hen screaming. Blanche, <laughs> the one you saw who enjoys Teletubbies. Oh, she is quite demanding. Not <laughs> and uh, she puts roosters to shame as far as how loud she <laughs> So, you know, 
I just want to encourage folks to step up, though, in an emergency and try to respond and take someone and just know that, like, we're all community. If something doesn't work out, we would all network and help. You know, we're so we're much of what we do is behind the scenes. This week, um, there was an air, a rooster abandoned in Poughkeepsie. I couldn't get there, but I networked with another activists she went and got them we sent over money for the or all the early vet care and then we we have this happening all the time we're all helping and so it's great if you if you see a rooster help them and then we'll, we'll all jump in <laughs> well i i kind of i would love to pose the question to you both to maybe just expand on it a little and that is the question of the uh, the panel, the general question of the panel, how can we dismantle who we see as a companion animal? Uh, what can we do? Um, and, and I think a lot of the answer to this in my mind is what you all do on social media. And we haven't really talked about that, but I think it's an important part of all this is to show the stories if you can and if you're comfortable with that. Uh, but telling and showing the stories of the animals of the chickens so that everybody knows the joy that you are experiencing mm -hmm. having these lovely beings in your home. But how can we dismantle this view that there is a narrow uh, uh, species list of animals that are companion animals and it's limited to these species. And when you're talking about other species, like chickens, like rats, like a, a lot of other species that are wonderful in the home, that though they're not seen as no, these are these are yeah, you know, these are dirty. These are uh, animals that are that can't be in homes. And you both kind of talked about this a little bit, but I don't know. I just I kind of want to give you the opportunity to maybe expand on it a little if you have anything more to say about it, uh, and also maybe talking about your social media presence and what your social media handles are, so we can find you because that's what I love the social media aspect. I have friended all these micro sanctuaries and that's what I <laughs> want my feed to be filled with is the stories of all the, you know, everybody, what everybody's little treat that they want to eat. And, you know, all, I love that stuff. So, um, so yeah, so, so if you want to expand on that a little bit, I would love that. Well, I mean, certain, certainly through opportunities like this, you know, to, but, um, I have to say, again, we have zero, zero budget. We are a micro sanctuary, mostly self-funded. And so, um, you know, social media really kind of is it, I have to say. And in community, like I share a lot in community trying to do presentations at local libraries and stuff. But the power of social media, I know a lot of people are down on it and Facebook and all. And I, I, but I... I'm looking at the positive all the time of that. And a lot of those clips you saw, I would just be documenting the joys at home and you share it and um, you'd be surprised. It does, I think, if shared the right way with sort of the right ethics. I think you do start, I think micro centuries, especially activists like Quincy, um, Anissa, Justin, Rosemary, these, people are posting all the time, just very beautiful, ethical um, sharings uh, about chickens. And it does cause change. And I believe the reason that, I'll just say this, I believe the reasons that some of the bigger sanctuaries are seeing, like they said, more change with birds is a lot of the smaller active, the groups and small micro sanctuaries for chickens have really I mean, and I'm not even talking about mine at all. I'm so impressed with the work that everyone's doing. I go into Vegans with Chickens, which is the Facebook group, and you learn everybody's doing such incredible work at the micro sanctuary level and not just good quality care, but I've learned so much from all of them. So I think social media can't be underestimated for this. We're forcing images and documentation and, and uh, sharing out into the public of chickens as these full beings, you know, full lives, fully developed individual autonomous <laughs> beings. Um, we're educating about them. And I, I've certainly since 2008 seen the change. I've seen the change, definitely. So I stay hopeful. Yeah, I would say, um 
social media plays an important role, definitely putting it out there. I also think um, I see, and again, I don't like, I don't um, think the focus should be, of course, on educating humans, like the non humans, um, you know, have every right to, to sometimes you're going to rescue a chicken that doesn't ever want to look at a human and that's fine too. Um, but those like with, when we have chickens, like Pluto is someone who ve benefits um, very much from human interaction. We've tried to pair him with hens before and he doesn't like them. <laughs> He's not, he just ignores them until a human comes along. So um, he actually, the main thing I would say that we do together that really changes people is I do work full time at an animal supply store and he works with me. So um, he's always there with me. He's always on the counter. He knows not to interact with dog. Like we have him on the counter. He's very protective from dogs. He knows to go into his crate when a big dog comes in, even in the store. Um, but that is people meeting. I mean, people love him. I mean, he's, I mean, again, I feel like I should just like, just talk about him. Like people just think he's, he's really amazing and people ask questions you know and I can say well he's rescued from cockfight and everything oh that's a bummer they always say oh I can tell but he's just molting so don't so three years ago he was rescued from cockfighting so no you can't tell he's just molting but people always say they can tell because he's always molting so heavy so molting is when they drop their feathers and Pluto always drops a lot of his feathers at a time um anyways the moral of the story is people at the store love him non-vegans people that um, just have never interacted with roosters and it gives me a chance to just tell the truth just tell his truth that's the most important thing we can do is tell their truth um you know people oh I knew a rooster once he attacked me well it's probably because you were taking the hen's eggs and they were alerting the rooster that they didn't like something you were doing so he came in to protect the hens and things like that so it just gives an opportunity for education. If you want to pet his waddles, you're gonna get some food bombs and you want to pet his waddles. So um, it works, it's a win-win. Mm -hmm. Awesome. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'd love to know maybe kind of as a, as a wrapping up question um, from uh, each of you, uh, if you can maybe say a little bit about how you think caring for chickens um, made you better activists. Uh, and advocates like for veganism, for chickens, for, you know, ending animal agriculture, like, you know, however approach you want to take to it, but like, you know, I'm, I'm really would love to know like how that direct relationship of caregiving and, you know, building um, bonds at your sanctuaries and micro sanctuary, like how that you feel like transitioned into to you being an activist. Yeah, I can go first. I think you're muted, Rebecca. Yeah, Quincy, do you want to go ahead and go? Sure, sure, sure. Um, sorry, what was the question? So how, oh, so I, I mean, I became an activist because of a chicken called Sonny that I met 11 years ago. Um, he, I was a vegan for years after knowing him. Um, it, it took a while to click, um, but I, I fell for chickens uh, really hard. So I would say that they, I mean, they're absolutely the reason for my activism. You know, I went to um, Chicken Run Rescue pretty early on and Mary, who is like my mentor and um, who I've been working with for years, you know, told me point blank, you cannot, you can't rescue and love chickens and eat eggs. And I was just like, what? Like, how would she say that to me? And then on the way home, um, that, that was when I gave up eggs and went vegan because it just like really clicked. So I think um, for me, it's, it's all chickens. It's, there was never anything Oh, that's so corny. There's never anything before chickens. There wasn't. There was never. <laughs> there wasn't activism or, um, you know, a lot of that. They taught me about. I mean, they taught me. They're the reason I'm like radical in my human rights views. They taught me everything. They're, they're amazing, and I just can't. Um, once you know them, you know, once you love a chicken and get to know them, it's um, they're not as uh, in intuitive. I feel like as a lot of other non-humans that are more like us. Um, so once you, like, once you learn to read a chicken's face, it's just like a mate, like they do, they make facial expressions. Um, yeah, so it's, that's it. That's my answer. That's, it's all chickens. Sorry. <laughs> it's all birds all the time. <laughs> um, echoing everything Quincy was so eloquent to say, I think that <laughs> I thought I was 
and animal rights, animal liberation, vegan activist before meeting Nellie. I will say I, I lived, grew up in New York City and at age 10, I did meet a chicken at camp and I stopped eating meat. But this was a my response as a fairly young person to just like, I, I don't wanna eat that being, but I didn't have any of the vegan education. Then I got that and went to work at a vegan sanctuary. And then I think I can't even begin to say the <laughs> how, you know, if the question is how they've changed us and our activism as vegan activists, it's so profound. It really is almost astonishing. Like it once you bond and create meet them on their terms as individuals and start to open up to their experiences, it honestly breaks down <laughs> so many other layers as a vegan activist of oppression and exploitation that I did not even see. And it's sort of too big a thing to even lay out here, but the act of bringing Nellie home was fairly revolutionary at the time where I worked and uh, a statement and then it really literally transformed my thinking, not just about the rights of Nelly and his kinds and his people, but like uh, myself as a vegan activist and, and whose oppression I was noting and whose I wasn't. And um, it's just so profound and to this day it continues to be that way. I do wanna say that I think as land animals, I wanna speak out for, uh, lab animals, there's no actual known statistics about how many of them survive. So chickens are definitely the top, 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 top. Um, but I, we have no idea how many lab mice and lab rats are as land animals are extinguished as well. So um, my heart is really with um, the ones made most invisible in this sort of tidal wave of annihilation that we've somehow managed to hide. It's profound. Like, how can you hide 68 billion lives being extinguished? So uh, with chickens, if you, if, if people connect with chickens, they will connect to that. And that is the scariest, most profound thing. And it's transformative for society. So it's really critical. Well said, really well said. Uh, I think we're probably going to wrap it up there. I think, Justin, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, really incredible presentations and work that both of you are doing. Thank you, Quincy. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, just really uh, inspirational. Uh, I loved it all. Thank and you so much. Uh, of course. And two just quick things, if you want to put them in the chat, Rebecca, you got a question about the cardboard bedding. If you could maybe give somebody tips on that or where you get it. And also on your prayer flags, a couple people commented on your prayer flags behind you. And I know that you're going to have those soon because I've asked about those in the, in the past and you're, they're coming up in like a week or something that you're going to have this available, right? Yeah, you're muted, darling. She's muted, yeah. <laughs> I have so much ADHD. I have the chat mostly off because I, mm -hmm. I can't follow. They will. They are uh, really uh, handmade by the original Tibetan flag makers, third generation family that we got to partner with, um, and they made them because the cause was in line with their beliefs. It was a really an amazing experience. So they'll be on our our website. Thank you for yeah. inquiring. They're not there yet. Well, maybe put that in the chat. But yes. what you're is and where people can find them uh, coming up I think it's in about a week or so you said thank um, you and this is an example of a creative way we pay for our vet care because again we don't have ex a lot we have some really wonderful small individual people but so i oh, you know it's one of the creative ways you can um cover animal care and one last thing that's critical is we try as a small micro sanctuary not to link i don't fault anyone for doing this but the whole rescue an animal for money um relationship makes me so uncomfortable but people have to do that a lot of times to raise money for care but i i encourage people to find other means however possible there's a lot of creative ways we can fundraise to cover veterinary care so. wonderful 
All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you all so much for being here, for experiencing with us all together and and i'll say a, a couple of people mentioned uh karen davis and i and i did want to just uh say yeah it, it's true she pioneered this she started a chicken focused sanctuary in 1990 before anybody cared uh so it's amazing that her inspiration and her work and her pioneering built us to this place 30 years later where we can have a chicken webinar with 250 people signing up for it so how beautiful is that uh, it's it's wonderful to see the um, trajectory that we're on and how in hopefully 30 years in the future, it's going to be even better for chickens uh, because of the work of everybody, the panelists, everyone that's listening, everyone that's inspired by this. Uh, Justin, thank you so much for your help with this. He has been instrumental in uh, co-producing this webinar and I wanna uh, send it over to him to see if he has any final thoughts. Uh, yeah, sorry, it started to downpour here, so hopefully you were, <laughs> you won't be able to hear that. Um, yeah, I know, I just wanted to echo everything that you said, Hope, um, and thank also all the panelists who came. Um, I always love doing these uh, chicken webinars um, because I feel like I get to uh, chat with folks who I think are do amazing, do amazing work and also learn new things that I didn't know before myself. Um, and yeah, I, I uh, really huge shout out to everybody who was on today, um, who is doing the sanctuary and caregiving work. Um, these are folks that we uh, interact with a lot through the Vegans with Chickens Facebook group, which I highly encourage anybody who's interested in chicken rescue to join. Um, and, uh, you know, folks who have done a lot of work as well for building up the um, awareness of micro sanctuaries. So thank you, uh, Rebecca and Quincy for all of that. So um, yeah, no, it's amazing. Uh, I, I, I'm really excited that, that so many people continue to be uh, interested in learning about chickens. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> thank you um, everyone for coming. It was a really wonderful experience. Uh, we will be having the videos available. So if you missed one of the speakers and or you wanna share them with your friends, please do and share them on your social media pages. We uh, will have uh, the individual speakers on video up at the humanehoax.org website as well as uh, UPC's website. So they'll be in both places uh, very soon, as soon as Justin can do it. Thank you, Justin, for dealing with that. He deals with all that. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's just um, incredible. And we appreciate your love and respect and uh, your desire for justice for chickens. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.